just love birds, don't you? Sure you do, and that's why you're going to love earning your bird study merit badge. Hello, I'm Cat Scout Randy, Troop 1 Ravens Patrol, and today's training is all about birds. I want to introduce our guest instructor, Dr. Al Batras, visiting lecturer at Cat Scouts University. He received his PhD in birds in 1988 from Los Gatos College and currently is the Tigger and Misty Feldman Professor of Ornithology at Scratching Post University in Pine Bluff, Tennessee. Welcome, Professor, and thank you for joining us today. Good to be here, Randy. Thanks for having me. Professor, let's begin with a little background on birds. Our viewers are new cat scouts, and for the most part, their exposure to birds has probably been quite limited. They live in houses, quite a different world from that of wild birds, what with those worlds connected only by windows. How do wild birds differ from those our members are familiar with? Well, Randy, the first thing to consider is that, other than birds seen from afar, you are probably only familiar with a few birds that end up in your food bowl. These birds in cans, or poultry as they are sometimes known, are not like the birds you see through the window, or the birds that inhabit the wilderness. No, these are farm animals who have volunteered to be your breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Always be thankful for their generosity. Birds of the outdoors are wild creatures, which exist in hundreds of varieties and exist in numbers beyond imagination. They have fascinating behaviors and inhabit a wide variety of ecological niches which determine the food they eat, the nests they build, and how they avoid getting eaten. Good to know, Professor. So I guess it would be fair to say that, for our Cat Scout members, they should regard the wild birds of the great outdoors to be a precious resource to be observed and appreciated as part of nature, not food. That's right, Randy. It's a great privilege to seek out wild birds in their native habitats and learn their ways. They can be beautiful and entertaining to watch. Besides, wild birds don't taste very good, even if you could catch them. Gamey. What would you say to any of our new members who, once outside in the fresh air, feel their ancestral hunting instincts taking hold? If they can't catch the birds they find, what about catch and release? Well, Randy, it's tempting, but no. You can put your eyes on wild birds, but not your paws. I can tell you from bitter experience, when I was a farm kitten that was allowed to roam outside and get into mischief, if you actually catch a wild bird, many will poop on you, and so you'd be sorry if you did. Wow, I did not know that. Okay, listen up, Cat Scouts. You heard Professor Look, but don't touch. Let's talk about the kinds of birds there are out there. What are our members likely to see when they go bird watching? That's a good question. There are over 900 bird species that have been found in North America. So, depending on where you go, you could easily see several dozen if you visit the right locations for viewing and if you know what to look for. Can we show the chart? Yeah, th there it is. Okay. Well, look at that. So there are over 900 types of birds out there. That's amazing. Yes, and they are quite varied. The smallest is the bee hummingbird at two inches from tip of beak to tip of tail and the largest is the California condor, with a wingspan of up to 10 feet. Some have rather bland colored feathers so they blend into their surroundings, making them harder to see, while others, such as a mallard duck, are quite the fashionistas, with their loud colored feathers that make them quite a sight to behold. There are also quite a variety of sounds that these birds make. In fact, I brought along a few recordings to give your audience a taste for the range of bird calls that they might want to listen for when they're out on their hikes and campouts. Gee, Professor, that's swell. Let's listen to them. Okay, let's play the first one. <coughs> Golly, Professor, even I know that one. That's a raven, right? That's right, Randy. Good for you. Here's another one. See if you can identify it. 
Uh, is that a finch? Right again. Specifically, that's an American goldfinch. Okay, play another one. Oh, wow. That's awesome, Professor. I have no idea what that one is. Well, that's a pheasant. They're forest dwellers, so you might hear this call if you're on a hike through the woods. Cool. Could you play another one? Sure. How about this? Ooh, I know. That's some kind of owl, I think, right? That's right. That's a great horned owl. They prey on small mammals, so make sure you keep an eye on the Kit Scouts if you're out during the evening. Okay, we have time for one more. All right, I saved this one for last because it's quite important that every Cat Scout recognize this sound. Uh, sounds interesting, but what's the big deal? Randy, I'll give you a hint. If you're out walking on a sunny day and you hear that call, better run. And if you see this, it might be too late. For that is the call of the American Bald Eagle, which would consider a Cat Scout of any size to be a nice snack. Okay, gang, you all heard that. Memorize that one for sure. You don't want to take a one-way trip on American Bald Eagle Airlines now, do you? Let's talk about bird observation techniques. What should Cat Scouts know about how to look for birds when they're out and about? There are various ways to observe birds. You can keep an eye and ear out for them while hiking, which allows you to cover more ground and to move through the various bird habitats. But you must keep as quiet as possible when doing so. And it is likely that many times you will only hear rather than see the birds you are hoping to see. That's why studying bird calls is so valuable. Another way to observe birds is to settle into a stationary observation point. Bird experts often situate themselves at a viewpoint that gives them visibility to a large area where birds are likely to appear, such as a lake, river, or a bluff overlooking an open range. In these situations, it's best to have binoculars or a special bird telescope because if you see a bird of interest, it's likely to be fairly distant from your position. To get closer to birds, you can try setting yourself up in a blind, which is a small structure that you can hide in, and it will have a little viewing port that allows you to see out. These can be helpful to getting a closer look at birds if you're out in the open. The more effort you put into your blind, the better your chances of successful bird viewing. So, Professor, when we spot a bird, well, what should we do? Well, Randy, a good bird observer tries to identify what species of bird it is. Then, if it's a species they've never seen before, they can add that one to their lifetime list of birds they've seen and brag about it. Oh, I see. Cool. So, how do we identify the species? If you can hear its call, that may help if you know what the call sounds like. But you don't get credit just for hearing the bird. You've got to see it, which makes the game tougher. Upon sighting a bird, the bird that you think is new for you, or for one of your gang, pull out your binoculars and get a closer look. Grab your field guide and flip through it until you find that bird in the book based on the way it looks and, if possible, by its behavior. Is it rooting for bugs on the forest floor? then it's probably not a hawk. Does it have red spots on its wings? Then it might be a red-winged blackbird. And so on. Oh, great. That's really helpful. Can you tell us about some specific birds that we're likely to come across on our continent? Sure, Randy. Consider the blue jay, generally the king of the bird feeder. The sparrow are very social and avid Twitter users. The woodpecker is nature's percussionist. The duck, this one a mallard, 
is known as a drake if it's a male rather than a duck, and it wears these eye-catching colors to help it get dates, except during baseball season. The owl is a night hunter, and it likes to eat insects, other birds, and small mammals like you. The pelican dives from the air into the water to catch fish. It does not deliver kittens. That would be the stork. The heron often pierces its prey with its sharp beak and then eats it whole. Sometimes herons choke because they try to eat prey that's too big to fit down their necks, like kit scouts. The painted bunting is fiercely territorial. These colorful birds have been known to attack boxes of crayons. The Canada goose migrates south every winter to take advantage of the favorable exchange rate. Quail. The plume on this one's head shows that it's returning from Sunday services. Vultures eat anything dead except dead clowns, which taste funny. Now, here are a few of the odd ones. The hooded merganser. This handsome duck sports a retractable feather crest. The bee hummingbird, which I mentioned a while ago, is the smallest bird species known only two inches from beak to tail. The white ibis. Its long curved beak is the perfect tool for fishing small prey from shallow waters, including crayfish and fish treats that it can't even see from above. No, this is not a station identification break. This is the male Indian peafowl displaying the large colorful feathers to impress the girls. Now, let me show you a few dangerous birds to avoid. Seagulls will actually peck your eyes out if given a chance. Snowy owls with their wingspan of up to five feet. Who, who, who do they want to carry away? Why, you! and the aforementioned eagle. If you weigh more than 10 pounds, you probably are too big for one of these to carry off. Yikes, Professor. I guess a cat scout really needs to watch his back when looking for birds. That's right, Randy. While you're looking for them, some of the bigger meat eaters could be on the lookout for tender young juicy cat kebabs. It's mainly the kit scouts to be concerned about because they're smaller and easier to pick off. Good to know, Professor. Any final thoughts for our bird studies trainees? Yes. Bird watching can be a wonderful pastime and is to be encouraged. Take precautions to avoid being eaten by one of the biggies and you'll be fine. And hang on to your Kit Scouts. Oh, I think I just figured out why we always have the Kit Scouts carry those heavy tubs of cat litter on our hikes. It's to make them too heavy for the big birds to lift. Okay, Cat Scouts, that's our bird studies training. Special thanks to Professor Albatross for his participation and insights. This is Cat Scout Randy, Troop One, Ravens Patrol, over and out. Hey Cat Scouts, Skizix here. I hope you liked that training. Now it's time to log into your account at CatScouts.com to review and perform any remaining task you need to do to earn this merit badge, including passing the exam. Or did you just watch this video for fun or something? Maybe you're not even a member. Then you might want to go over to CatScouts.com and join because it's really fun and you can make friends and go camping and tie knots and stuff. See you over there.